Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Line Men and an Elephant. As some of you may know, this past week, for only the second time in 30 years, I took a helicopter flight. It was a doors-off excursion designed to test the metal of Sony's new A7 III, but in the end it tested my metal as well. My friends had to practically pry me into the cockpit. Uh, it's another story before another time which you can actually see in our four-part micro-series, a relatively spontaneous romp shot almost exclusively on an iPhone X with a little help from my friends entitled, I'm Not Going. I'll put a link to it down below or somewhere up here. But now, I want to talk a bit more about our actual shooting experience in the air and on the ground in the Mojave Desert at Sony's A7 III launch event, our time in a studio setting, our time at a restaurant shoot, and what each experience taught me about the A7 III and the Sony PZ-FE28-135 f4 cine lens and Sony's FE24-105 f4 regular lens. But first, let's take a look at some of the imagery we captured. On the run from my given disaster from the holy mind, pride That's where I never thought it would matter If I'm gone by now All my weakness keep on linger, linger on On repeat like it will be my favorite song Oh, I know I should be moving, moving on But you got me good, you got me good I keep on trying Pretend, keep on driving and driving along the road to never end. Lost my head on Vilma's back between the jars and bottle jug. Just me and all the red lights. Keep on driving and driving. Let's talk choppers. One, when you're flying doors off at 4,000 feet, you're only bringing one lens or two lenses on two bodies, both securely strapped to you. That's because everything that can be tied down has to be tied down, lest it somehow break free and get sucked up into the rotors, which would be very, very bad. Two, this isn't just about lenses, it's about everything. I had a honking 95mm variable ND filter in my pocket, but never took it out lest I fumbled with it and it got sucked up into the rotors. Three, and this is why I had it in my pocket in the first place. While the 28 to 135 is a brilliantly designed hybrid cine lens, just like its crop sensor little brother, the 18 to 110 F4 G OSS, it has autofocus and image stabilization on the one hand, but on the other also has geared rings with long and silky smooth manual throws power zoom, clicked or declicked aperture, and a massive lens hood. I found I couldn't mount that variable ND filter and lens hood simultaneously. Since it was one or the other, I chose the hood. 
figuring I'd let the shutter speed ride way higher in the process, as you can see most clearly in the footage immediately above the valley of fire red rocks, rather than deal with flare. The hood was, and is, great for preventing flare, but it was suboptimal in this setting, aside from the fact that I couldn't mount an ND, for another reason altogether. As soon as I swiveled right and poked the lens just inches past the door frame, I could feel the jet stream threatening to rip the lens hood from its bayonet, or worse yet, the entire camera from my hands, or worse yet, me, woo, out the window. Now, I'm not saying it would have. I'm terrified about this. I'm saying it was a big lens hood on a big lens with fast air, the smaller, nimbler 24 to 105 we first encountered in Sedona and then bought shortly thereafter would have been a better fit, especially since I was unlikely to do manual focus pulls. The simple reality is that the 28 to 135 was designed A, for a camera with an internal neutral density filter. This is not a supposition, but fact. This was the lens launched with the original Sony FS7 and B, to be used with a rod system and matte box with filter holders. Which leads me to four. The one thing I wanted more in that cabin than any other on that flight was an internal neutral density filter. Hold that thought. And five, the four other things I wanted in that cabin were a smaller lens, better image stabilization, a flip out touch rear LCD, and more and better physically differentiated buttons, especially along the right rear fascia running from the record button to the AEL, the lock button. Now, don't get me wrong, the A7 III combined with the 28 to 135 was incredible. Uh, stellar image quality, outstanding, though not magical, autofocus, more about this soon. Wonderful dynamic range with what to my eye looked like very nice roll off from the highlights. Great photos of Claudia just inches away. Great imagery of the Hoover Dam thousands of feet away. So I don't mean to be piggy about this, but without a touch flippy screen, and locked into the use of back button autofocus, it was luck and a pile of blurry misses that finally allowed me to get a usable shot of Kaz Maida, who sat shoulder to shoulder with me in the chopper. It's important to qualify flippy screen by adding that little word touch. While small HD's focus monitor is pretty much a no brainer for cameras like the a7 III, in this case, the ability just to frame the image would have been good but really not enough. I'd have wanted touch focus as well, which you can't do with a small HD. Now hold this thought because we had a second camera lens combo in the cockpit at the same time, Claudia's GH5 with the Leica DG8-18, to which really drove home the point because the GH5's touch implementation is far superior to any Sony's. And even if we'd brought the focus with us, this would have meant more bulk, more buttons to push, more things to come loose. You get the idea. We also learned that there aren't many more, or we can't imagine many more conclusive scenarios than shooting from a chopper to understand that image stabilization technology, at least in cameras like these, becomes less and less effective as you move up in focal length or the vibrations get significant enough. As I just said, these things were made that much more apparent by our GH5 package shot by Claudia. It was dramatically smaller and more maneuverable in that very tight space and still would have been uh, if we'd used the more comparable like a DG12 to 62.8 to f4 we left in the hotel room, even allowing for the longer focal lengths at which most of our footage was shot on the a7 III. Though, I don't think anything short of a gimbal with something like a Z-arm could have taken out all of that vibration as we landed, and maybe not even then, and all of a sudden the GH5S not having any IBIS at all, well, and Claudia never accidentally hit the movie record button instead of firing the shutter for stills, as I did a number of times in the A7 III by confusing the movie record button with the remap back focus button, but that's on me, just needed to develop muscle memory. The bright light, the cramped and constrained cockpit, constant major vibration, and compositional and distance considerations played to the GH5's strengths, the IBIS, Ergo's touch flippy screen, 3.7 million dot EVF, while minimizing its primary weaknesses. Autofocus, it worked well in these conditions, and greater depth of field. You're not shooting uh, f1.8 up close for landscapes from the air, all else being equal. However many stops of dynamic range the GH5 has, call it 12, it was sufficient for our purpose. 
The same factor is mitigated against or simply minimize the value of the A7III's superiority like dynamic range, high ISO performance, autofocus speed, and easy shallow depth of field while accentuating its primary weakness, which even now remains ergonomics. Except as the light shifted during golden hour and much of the Hoover Dam fell into shadow, then high ISO performance, megapixels, and image stabilization became critical, as did not shooting through the glass. At that point, we were shooting at ISO 4000 to achieve 1 1,000th, 1 2,150th of a second, which was not fast enough. And then A7R3, R3 with IBIS off on a gimbal might have been a better choice. But with this said, Claudia loved the A7 III so much, more on this in a few moments, coming as she is from an A6300. And the A7 III is so compelling to me when it comes to other scenarios where autofocus, shallow depth of field, and low light performance, both in terms of noise and autofocus, are crucial advantages, <sighs> that this trip may end up costing me thousands, as in 2000. Because the Hilo also helped us realize in very concrete terms that there will be times where we don't need the a7 III to give us a simpler menu system. There's no time to futz at that point. The camera settings need to be locked down. Nor did we need unlimited recording. Two big GH5 advantages. We just didn't shoot for more than a minute or two at a time. And overheating was therefore never an issue. Though, given our documentary bend, I'd still like that recording limit gone in whatever camera we add next to our kit. And I've been spoiled by the GH5's uh, 3.7 million dot EVF, excellent rear touch flippy screen, ergos. Hold that thought too. Let's talk about what we learned in the desert rather than above it. One, racing across the Mojave in a dune buggy, strapped in not only through a four point harness, but having your wrists tethered to the steering wheel as well, so that if you flip, the roll cage won't snap your arms or wrists like pathetic little twigs is really no time to have a manufacturer's expensive evaluation unit around your neck. So number two, all of us, the entire press pool, left our units in their bags to be shuttled to the next location. Now, Ted Forbes, on the other hand, risked his personal GoPro and gimbal and got some fabulous shots. I held on to my iPhone 10 for dear life, and I quite like the results. The footage looks the way it felt to us. By the way, that's Claudia behind the wheel. Very badass, if you ask me. Three, that short flange distance I've mentioned before and the way it attracts dust to the sensor was on full display when we shot buggies helmed by professional drivers launching off the dune above us. The thing of it is, I don't remember removing the lens, yet there it was. Bottom line, don't leave home without your rocket blaster, and even that may not be enough. Maybe better sealing at the lens mount is an issue. I'm not sure. Four, did I mention the autofocus was stellar? Why, yes, Hugh, I believe you did. Did I mention the wonderful dynamic range? Yeah. Five, I enjoyed watching the 120 frames per second slow motion, but I wish it were even crisper, but that's on me. Clearly, I could have made it so with higher shutter speeds. Uh, I preferred my still images to the video in part for that reason, yet paradoxically, it was the low shutter speed motion blurred stills I liked best of all, but I might have felt differently if I'd shot the burst sequences at even higher shutter speeds, like one eight thousandth of a second, so high ISO even in daylight matters, but maybe not. Six, the camera itself worked so well and effortlessly that the only thing I wanted to do while shooting the buggies was, again, switching to the lighter and slightly wider 24 to 105. I did use the neutral density filter on the 28 to 135 here, but I missed not having the lens hood. Seven. Well, that's not exactly true. I wish that I had the patience and energy and foresight to schlep a fluid head tripod with me because that would have made a big difference in trying to follow the buggies on the ground. As would if I'd had a keener sense of where the buggies would be so that I could frame and anticipate the camera motion ahead of time, rather than trying to follow those suckers in real time. Eight. It was so dusty out there, not just sandy, that I should have cleaned my lens a lot more often. Let's talk about models. I've 
always felt that the relationship between model and photographer, or just photographer and subject, doesn't have to be a model, shows up in the photographs we co-create. So while Anthony and his colleague are both beautiful models, it was only after I spent time talking with them and getting them to break out of their blue steel or magnum looks that I captured my favorite image of them. I was less successful with the other models because I didn't take the time to get to know them even a little bit, and that's on me. But you want me to talk about the gear, so okay. In any case, the image quality was unassailable. And remember, this was with the 24 to 105 at that point, which I love, love, love. This lens's IQ combined with the utility of that focal range and the astonishingly shallow depth of field you can get when you rack it out to 105 and come in tight is fantastic. I was stunned at the a7III's ability to lock focus at very low EVs in difficult lighting. Maybe I shouldn't have been. It's spec'd to work down to minus 3 EV, but to me this is a big deal. The bottom line is this. As I said in my last video on the a7III, I understand why Sony chose to announce it at Whippy. The a7 III is an outstanding people camera, and in my book, little purpose is served by using a higher pixel count sensor or burst rate faster than 10 frames per second. The a7 III's 14-bit uncompressed RAW serves well in this scenario, as it does for landscape. Though for landscapes, so does the a7 III's 15 stops of dynamic range. And again, so does the a7 R 3s 42 megapixels. Finally, let's talk food shoot just for a moment. Really, just long enough to reiterate how much I love the 28 to 135's magnificent manual focus mode, which allows brilliantly languid focus pulls with just a twist of your wrist. And to say one more time that the low light capability of the sensor really is tremendous. Okay, that's what I learned. Let's wrap it up this way. If you're a photographer first and a videographer second, your primary emphasis is on people. You prioritize 10 tenths image quality and autofocus performance above all else without causing even the most beautiful people to cringe when they see inside their own pores with super high resolution sensors. You're happy to take the time to customize the camera to your particular shooting style and you will almost always be shooting with your eye to the viewfinder. It's easy for me to tell you that the a7 III is the best hybrid value on the market today. With lenses like Sony's 28mm f2, the 50mm f1.8, and now the 85 1.8 at 423, 198, and 548 bucks respectively, you can get into mirrorless full frame with small fast prime glass for just about three grand with unmatched autofocus image quality and low light performance, period. Hey, if you shoot landscape photography with these same provisos and don't crop the hell out of them or make billboard sized prints and then climb the freaking ladder on the billboard to pixel peep at one or two feet, same thing. Best value on the market today. Although, now that I'm in the zone, hey, if you shoot sports photography and you know your athlete's movements or the sports movements well enough then you don't need 20 frames per second either. So same thing, best value on the market today. Notice how the word value keeps popping up here. I find myself having the same kind of reaction to the a7 III that I had to the camera that first brought me into the Sony Fold, the a6000. Both punch way above their weight class. It's also easy for me to tell you that with Sony's G Master and GOSS lens lines, the Zeiss, Battis, and Loxia primes on the one hand, and Sigma's announcement of nine much more keenly priced but no less brilliant optically art lenses coming to native mount on the other, plus the ability to pretty much adapt any other lens out there you want to, you are buying into an extraordinary glass ecosystem with an incredible upgrade path. If you're comfortable with your Sony crop sensor camera like the A6000, A6300, A6500, and thinking about upgrading to enjoy the benefits of full frame. If you're comfortable with your first or second generation A7 variant, irrespective of what that variant is, 
but looking to upgrade for better ergos, better autofocus, longer battery life, better EVF, dual card slots, blah, 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 blah. If you're thinking about cutting over from DSLRs because you want no excuses video, relatively speaking, or simply want to stop chimping and don't mind Sony ergos and menus, and if in each case you can afford to do it and still have funds left over for everything else that's important, all I can say is do it. It's that good. On the other hand, if your emphasis is more on video, even a true 50-50 hybrid shooter with specific requirements, if your priorities run more to ergonomics, complete touch implementation, better menus, and completeness without having to tack on accessories, if you want even the best glass available to you to be the smallest and lightest it can be, if you want the best IBIS in the business except for the G9, which is even better, if you need to shoot video longer than 30 minutes or want the best video quality possible when you can also control the lighting or looking to do green screen or heavy grading. And if meh, autofocus is of no importance to you, it's easy for me to say that the GH5 is the better option for you. It has what its younger brother, the stills oriented G9 does not, 10-bit 422 all intra internal recording, more video autofocus tuning options, and unlimited recording limit. I can't tell you about the Fuji X-H1 because I haven't had it in hand yet, but it doesn't have those things either, though its autofocus system slots in closer to the A7III's with phase detection than the panties with contrast. All of which brings me to a final reflection and a set of points I want to make, which ends up being not really about the A7III at all, but about where we go from here and what I'd really like in my next camera. If Sony takes the A7III and then incorporates additional video-specific technology it already has in-house to create an A7 IV or maybe an A7S III, much closer to probability. And by already in-house, I mean a variable electronic neutral density filter, which first appeared on the FS5. The absence of a recording limit of any kind, which is the case in any of its dedicated video cameras, including the new Z90, which we also had with us and will be covering separately. And outstanding wireless microphone tech like their UWP Lav series, maybe even offering a new optional grip which houses only one extra battery to make room for the guts of their dual channel wireless receiver, the uh, URX P03D, and a flippy screen. They will create a camera for the ages, one that immediately floats to the top of our list, limited touch interface and still crazily complex menus notwithstanding. Hey, if all Sony did was add the variable electronic ND, that alone would be a huge draw, if the price were keen enough. That's because, and this becomes really interesting to me, with the low light performance of the a7 III as it is, bumping up against the a7S II, a7R III, and a9, the real issue is no longer high ISO performance, is it? It's low ISO performance, specifically low, super low ISO video performance, as in shooting f1.8 or even f1.4 wide open, 1 or 1 of a second in broad daylight without futzing around with external filters. Now, if Sony doesn't do this, okay, I understand I'm being piggy. Though I just want to add, sure, Sony could offer bit depth, codec, and recording limit parity with the GH5, at least I think I can, and the A7 III already has that kind of parity with the G9, while absolutely smoking both panties autofocus and dynamic range, but adding neutral density, internal neutral density, along with these other things, would smoke everybody. Oh, one small thing about the a7 III. I like that Sony has removed the locking button on the mode dial. It always seemed reversed to me. You had to push it down and turn the dial at the same time, instead of the way it works on the GH5 and, and other cameras too, where you can rotate the dial and then push in the button to lock the position if you want to. Anyway. That's what two hours in a Eurocopter EC-130 over the Mojave Desert, another half hour in a dune buggy racing across the Mojave Desert, a couple of hours in a studio setting, and a couple more in a restaurant led me to think about last week. And with all of this said, it's still amazing how much you can do with just a smartphone. If you want to. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. Please support our work by using our no cost to you affiliate links or even making a contribution directly via the PayPal link in the show more section below. 
As always, we thank you for it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.